Chapter 1, The Gangster, Disciples Sealed with twenty star shields of King David, the ancient Hebrew Israelite king. The white garage door, filthy with dirt and grime, accumulated over the years had been spray painted with a blue six-pointed star and a pair of crossed pitchforks. In the center of the six-pointed star were the bold letters G.D. Directly across the alley, another garage door riddled with holes that suggested indiscriminate gunplay instead of child play, bore the sign of a top hat, cane, and gloves, and a five-pointed star. Beneath it were the large capital letters, VL. For years, these two garages sat opposite of each other. Likewise, for years, those who had drawn the six-pointed star sat in opposition to those who had drawn the five-pointed star. However, just as time and change will eventually destroy both garages, time and eventual change will also destroy the concept that people as members of opposite organizations must violently oppose each other. The time has come for all street organizations commonly referred to as street gangs to refocus their energies and begin to unite around the issues that will bring us together instead of lingering on our differences. Our young membership needs to be made aware of the facts surrounding our beginning and heed the urging of our leadership that will get back to the basics of our organization, i.e. build a positive force in our respective communities and put an end to self-destructive concept of opposition. The concept of violent opposition between street organizations only serves one purpose. It puts into motion the divide and conquer rule, which means simply that as long as we are divided, we will be conquered. In this book, we offer a powerful argument for a new concept as the single best hope for restoring the positive vigor that our organization once knew. We will begin by offering a concise history of our organization and describe how we came to be known as the Gangster Disciples, which eventually evolved into a new concept, growth and development, sealed with 20 star shields of King David, the ancient Hebrew Israelite king. The Black Gangster Disciple Nation was born out of two organizations. In the beginning, there were two separate organizations, the Disciple Nation, whose president was David Barksdale, and the Gangster Nation, whose president was Larry Hoover. There were many branches of both organizations. Some of the disciple nation under David Barksdale's leadership were Devil's Disciples, 
Falcon disciples, royal disciples, renegade disciples, executioner disciples, boss pimp disciples, east side disciples, Sircon disciples, Motown disciples, Dutchtown disciples, Gonzalo disciples, Six Train disciples. Maniac Disciples and Folk Trade Disciples. Also, during this period of time, David Barksdale controlled the Dell Vikings, the Black Souls, and the West Side Cobras. Some of the branches of the gangster nation under Larry Hoover's leadership were the Supreme Gangsters, the first branch and was considered to be the father of the gangster nation. Imperial Gangsters, African Sniper Gangsters, Raven Gangsters, High Supreme Gangsters, Russian Gangsters, Maniac Gangsters, Mafia Gangsters, 75th Street Syndicate Gangsters, Outlaw Gangsters, 95th Street Supreme Gangsters, The Dells Gangsters, West Side Supreme Gangsters, Rocketeer Gangsters, East Side Syndicate Gangsters, Gentile Gangsters, and the P Black Pimp gangsters of the west side, everybody in the city of Chicago who was a disciple or gangster was under the leadership of David Barksdale or Larry Hoover, respectively. Up until that point in our history, no one in any organization had ever been referred to as a king. At that time, the Vice Lords, the Black Stone Rangers, or Stones, and the Disciples were the three major gangs, street organizations, in the city of Chicago. In terms of membership numbers and organizational structure, the Vice Lords were the first major black street gang in Chicago. They opened and operated various businesses along 16th Street in the Lawndale area. Some of the businesses that they opened were a restaurant, clothing boutique, tasty freeze, pool room, teen town dance studio, and an art studio. In addition, they offered many programs for the benefit of the community. The Vice Lords reached their peak between the years 1957 and 1967. They were the father of the super gangs and had their origin on the west side of Chicago. They were the forerunners of the concept of changing street gangs into organizations. In the years 1963 and 1964, two South Side street gangs started to take a form that would eventually evolve into two of the most powerful street organizations in Chicago. They were the Black Stone Rangers and the Black Disciples. During the reign of these two organizations, the Black Stone Rangers were believed to be the most organized because they held national recognition, support from prominent businessmen, entertainers, 
and politicians. They entered into a business venture with the late great Sammy Davis Jr. and had the support of the late W. Clement Stone, a self-made millionaire and business entrepreneur. However, one of the most impressive displays of the political power and community importance of a street organization came when Jeff Ford, leader of the Blackstone Rangers, was invited to the late Richard Nixon's inauguration. The Blackstone Rangers were originally founded by Eugene Harrison and Jeff Ford. Under Jeff Ford's leadership, they prospered and changed their organization's name to the Black Peacestone Nation. And eventually they became known as the Irukins. David Boxdale, the leader of the Black Disciple Nation, had an organization that was comparable to the Blackstone Rangers. Although he did not receive the same amount of national recognition, he was well known throughout the city of Chicago and was respected by his friends and feared by his foes. At the time, David Boxdale was the most revered street organizer in Chicago. On the other hand, among these two major street organizations on the south side of Chicago were the Gangsters, a young street organization striving for a place of high recognition and respect in the city of Chicago. The Blackstone Rangers and the Black Disciple Nation were vying to bring the gangsters in as part of their respective organizations. Jeff Ford, as leader of the Black Peacestone Nation, brought Larry Hoover an offer to incorporate the gangsters as part of the Black Peacestone Nation structure as gangster stones and offered Hoover the less favorable position as an ambassador within the Black Peacestone Nation. In Hoover's mind, such a merger would swallow up the gangster identity. Therefore, Hoover declined. When Jeff Ford offered Hoover the opportunity to incorporate he was unaware of just how strong the gangsters were rapidly becoming. With branches of gangsters throughout the city of Chicago, Hoover's empire had reached the Morgan Park area on the southwest side, across 95th Street, and well into the far south edges of the city. The gangsters swelled from Ashland and Halstead on the west, to Cottage Grove on the east. Pockets of gangsters were scattered throughout every district on the south side of Chicago, and membership was rapidly growing on the west side. Larry Hoover had put together the Black Gangster Nation which would vie for power and battle the stones and disciples for years to come. In January 1969, David Boxdale, leader of the Disciple Nation, developed a broader vision about the mission and purpose of street organizations commonly referred to as street gangs. In essence, David was tired of the senseless violence and mayhem 
that was destroying the black community because of street gangs warfare. He struggled with the idea of how to bring an end to the constant gang warfare that existed between the disciples and the gangsters. He realized that such a state of existence would only bring about self-destruction in the lives of ghetto youth. Therefore, he made an offer that Hoover could not refuse. David proposed merging the two organizations with Hoover, sharing equal power. From that merger, the black gangster disciple nation was born. This began the era of kings. Never before in the history of Chicago had gang leaders been known as kings. Looking back, it was an ambiguous situation, but it was a necessary compromise to stop the gang wars and save the lives of members on both sides. David Barksdale was wise enough to know that by bringing Hoover an offer to share the throne of gang leadership as two kings with equal power, Hoover would accept and thereby end the bloodshed between the two organizations. David was willing to give up so much because he had a broader vision and a creatively positive direction for the two organizations. Such were the circumstances surrounding the birth of the black gangster disciple nation. The merger was uplifting for both organizations. It allowed many negative energies to turn into positive energies. And together the two unified organizations became active in community affairs. They opened and operated a gas station, two restaurants, community cleanup programs, and enforced school truancy policies. The Inglewood Business Men's Association worked hand in hand with our organization for the betterment of the community. The Black Gangster Disciples were given a security contract for Wilson Junior College located on 70th and Stewart Streets in the Inglewood District. Our members were given jobs in the 63rd Street Shopping Concourse as security guards, salespersons, and they also worked in the neighborhood bank. One of our members still holds the same job he acquired during this period. The Business Men's Association assisted us in obtaining centers for our organization. The first to open was on 63rd and Normal Streets and 61st and Hofstede Streets, out of which David Boxdale operated a free breakfast program for the community. Another center was located at 68th and Hofstede Streets, out of which Larry Hoover operated a free lunch program to feed the needy children in the community. Our trouble as an organization began when we start dealing in big city politics. Before that, we were largely overlooked. We became active in community issues and got involved with the Reverend Jesse Jackson and Operation Bread Basket. We formed the LSD Coalition 
which was an acronym for Lords, Stones, and Disciples. We marched and picketed the Red Rooster Grocery Store, which was a large food chain that contributed primarily to the black community. We were successful in shutting down the Red Rooster chain and stop the selling of bad meat to the black community. We marched with the Reverend Jesse Jackson to force the hiring of black contractors to help build Circle Campus. We made up 80% of the participants in that march. We marched nonviolently with Dr. Martin Luther King in Marquette Park during the peak of the Civil Rights Movement. We were fast becoming known as a potentially powerful grassroots movement that would carry the fight against racism, segregation, inequality, and unemployment right up to the City Hall steps as well as throughout the voting booths of the city of Chicago. In essence, we became a threat to the status quo of the inner city politics and the powers that be. It is no mistake that at the same time as our organization became such a threat to the powers that be, mysteriously, all major street organizations had drugs made readily available to them for mass distribution throughout the black community. Of course, drugs had been in the black community all the time, but with very limited access. Then all of a sudden, as we matured into a power to be reckoned with, our membership began to receive highly lucrative offers from here to four unknown sources to package and distribute drugs for a living. After becoming so positively involved in the social and positive political aspects of our communities, drugs were introduced to shut us up politically and appease us financially. However, drugs also ended the positive direction of our organization's movement. In that sense, the powers that be could not have been happier. As an organization, we had fallen into their trap and they closed the door and swallowed the key. Shortly before the flood of drugs into the black community, there was a spirit of camaraderie, a sense of belonging which fostered love, our first principle, honesty, and a feeling of being a part of something great, our organization. Many problems were solved in our neighborhoods because everyone looked upon each other as part of the same family. Drug dealers and users were initially frowned upon. Nevertheless, with the huge and lucrative influx of drugs, suddenly drug dealers were success stories. The role models for instant riches, representatives of the good life 
quote unquote. Our organization lost many of its members to the drug game, either directly or indirectly. The positive potential that these lost members had is unimaginable and immeasurable. Through drug usage, loyalties shifted or became non-existent. Those who were not consumers splintered off to control turf or neighborhood strips. Our losses continued to swell. Many of our members became known as the walking dead, quote unquote, the dope fiends, and were constantly in and out of jail and prisons throughout the state of Illinois, as well as the country of America. As far as the positive growth and development of the members of our organization is concerned, the users, sellers, and all associated with the drug trap paid a price that has yet to be tallied. While jobs, social and educational programs are constantly being slashed out of the government budget, drugs have become an industry in the black community as well as in the poor communities nationwide. Some of us who were caught up in the trap have become aware of the fact that a great change is needed in our lifestyles. Larry Hoover is one of us who has become aware and his message is that we need to focus our energies towards eradicating the predicament that we find ourselves in. The blueprint will not only enrich our lives but it is a progressive step for many of us in the return to a positive direction.